Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first discussion portion of Talking Day. I am very lucky to have the indefatigable Mr. D with me. Hello, sir. Hello, AM. Very, very, very happy to be here. Absolutely wonderful to have you on. Now, we are going to be talking about the, the talking aesthetic. So I've tried to sort of organize Talking Day that we're covering off most bases regarding him. Uh, we're talking about his, you know, the political sort of aspects of Lord of the Rings. We're talking about the literary aspects of Lord of the Rings, um, various artistic aspects to it as well. There's a biography. Um, but I thought, you know, obviously a huge amount of people are sort of drawn to the um, the aesthetic of the films, at least. And um, to a lesser extent, perhaps the illustrations of talking himself, say, for example, in The Hobbit. But um, I'm very much interested to explore the um, the the imagery of, of The Lord of the Rings, not just um, the illustrations themselves, but uh, the cartography element of um, Tolkien, of course, the various maps, and um, perhaps a little note on the um, the calligraphy of his um, constructed alphabets as well. Um, but I thought, um, Mr. D, as a as a fellow Tolkien fan and um, as the resident art expert within our circle, uh, would be the perfect person to have on. And um, I do believe this is the the first stream where you and I have ever been on outside of unpopular opinions. So this is um, this is quite an occasion. Um, anyway. Um, Regarding an introduction, is there anything you want to sort of say in summary before we start? Well, I, I will add that I was, uh, I think like a lot of people, I was unfamiliar with um, with Tolkien's, the, I mean, the extent of his body of, uh, of, of visual art, artwork. I mean, I knew that he drew, and obviously I, I knew that uh, some of his illustrations appeared in various editions of... Uh, you know of of his of his books, especially the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. But uh, I I don't think anyone really knew the extent to which he was sort of involved in in the kind of visualization of of his his ideas and in 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 art in general. And I think it it came out uh, relatively recently. You know, I would say that you know in the past certainly twenty years or so, there a lot of the work that that has ended up in the Bodleian Library. Um, has basically been exhibited and come to light that been catalogs published on it. So it's getting a lot more exposure. And I, I'm sort of interested in the idea of placing Tolkien within uh, within the, the tradition of the visual arts, you know, not just as a kind of side, you know, sort of a hobbyist, uh, as, as I think he's, he's, he's kind of regarded or was regarded in the past. <clears throat> Absolutely. So... Um... So for this process, you have um, uh, selected um, several images for me, essentially. Um, we've got about 40 images to go through. Um, I've got a couple of notes at the end, but we'll see if we have time to go through them. And um, we'll essentially go through these images and um, uh, you can you know, explain your thoughts as to how this pertains to um, Tolkien. And it should also be noted for the stream um, that Tolkien's work also includes a lot of illustrations for some of his other children's novels and we're going to be focusing on the Tolkien aesthetic as in the Tolkien aesthetic pertaining to the legendarium things relating to the Silmarillion the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit itself not to the you know extensive um, literary oeuvre um, beyond the Lord of the Rings to keep the the topic on the legendarium if that is all right uh, so without further ado uh, let us start with this first picture um, which I believe is Uccello's Saint George and the Dragon Yes, uh, Uccello's uh, St. George and the Dragon. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of put this in here as a starting point. I have a lot of images at the beginning, which sort of, I, I was trying to kind of trace the the variety of, of, of influences upon Tolkien's visual aesthetic. Uh, and, you know, he was, you know, to some extent, the product of his day. And there were certain sort of strains going around. I mean, now, of course, this, you know, this painting is is, is quite familiar should be quite familiar to most people. It's a very famous painting in the National Gallery uh, in London. And, um, you know, I think it sort of presents this, you know, this idea that had been, you know, by, by the time of the cello had been firmly established of the kind of chivalric idea of, of, what, the, of what the distant, you know, quote, Middle Ages were like. You know, I, I think that it, it was very much 
this work and as well as well as illuminated manuscripts before this time uh, that that I think to, to, to later generations really cemented the idea of what this the kind of quasi fantastical world of the of the past and certainly the U European past and specifically the British past uh, of uh, you know the world was like and I, I think that uh, I, I also put this because I, I think in the 19th century um, you know the um, you know sort of when Tolkien was you know was was kind of born or the Mew he was born into um, experienced a kind of huge revival of interest in uh, these ideas of chivalry and the in the Middle Ages, the depictions of, of of you know the kind of medieval world. Uh, so if you think of the pre-Raphaelite artists, yeah. um, and uh, you know, and 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 will you know William Morris and and ju and just in general, there was a huge mania for for uh, a kind of medieval aesthetic. But it was it was very much an aesthetic that was not so much uh, not so much contingent upon being uh, ac uh, accurate to the period, you know, it was very much laced with kind of fancy and fantasy. Uh, and so I think that's some, something very important to keep in mind because, because you know, like, again, it, this is the world that Tolkien was, was born into and I, I, I do think that it had probably had a heavy influence on the way he imagined his own kind of creations. Now, in, in contrast to this, so obviously this is a um, a height of the Renaissance painting. Um, you have given me some of the 36 views of Mount Fuji, um, which is a, a part of an, a Japanese art style called um, uh, Yokoyo-i, uh, which is essentially late Edo period before the end of the before the end of the um, the Meiji you know, period, so around 1800 ish. Um, how do you think this um, informs the work of Tolkien? Well, I I think that again I'm I'm sort of looking at the various threads in in sort of visual art culture that were still uh, very much present at the time you know in the, in and around the time of his birth and his growing up and another huge influence at the time I mean aside from uh, the, you know the medievalists and pre Raphaelites and, and and all of them was the was the massive influence of uh, of Oriental artwork, specifically Japanese artwork, uh, in uh, the influence of that upon European, uh, the European aesthetics of the time, and it, it can't be overstated. I mean, if you look at groups of artists li uh, like the kind of post-impressionist, uh, like Vincent van Vincent van Gogh, and 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 uh, you know, to a lesser extent, Gauguin, Henri Toulouse Lautrec, and you know, you know, these were artists who were hugely influenced by this kind of uh, graphical culture of Japan that ha that had, of course, also was was really kind of beginning to make purchase in Europe at the time. And and uh, if you think of you know Gilbert and Sullivan uh, uh, and the Mikado and, and things like that, I mean, the, 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 this again, this aesthetic of 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 a real world that was also a kind of a distant fantasy, uh, I think, had a huge influence on the, the artistic culture of the time. Um, so, and also, what helped these these works to, to circulate is that they were, you know, they were relatively inexpensive. I mean, mm. uh, you know, these were all, you know, the hoku size prints. I mean, they're all woodcuts, and mm. and so, you know, that they were at the time, you know, relatively easy to kind of. Uh, uh, and easy and cheap to come across, and so uh, you know they they had huge circulation, and uh, so I, I think that you know there's a strange mixture of both this kind of Eastern aesthetic and this kind of mythos of 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 the kind of ancient history of of, of Europe and of Britain that we're all kind of mixing around at the time. Yes, I think just um, to elucidate on this point, I mean. Um, hopefully you'll correct me and hopefully I won't sound like too much of a philistine um, but obviously when we're talking about um, Tolkien's academic interests you know, his main interests were Germanic languages so he focused on the early history of England um, he was particularly fascinated by Gothic and for people who don't know Gothic mm -hmm. is not just an art style 
Gothic was were, were people and a language. Um, the only branch of East Germanic, which supposedly existed sometime in the um, in the Ukraine, and um, also had a possession in Crimea, which lasted until relatively recently, until the 15th century. But nevertheless, when we look at um, Tolkien's influences, and I've gone over this with um, Nathan Hood, the various historical and mythological influences um, behind Tolkien, um, they're very much situated within Europe and the idea of Christendom, or the Roman Empire, what have you. However, when I look at his art style, well, not necessarily explicitly in the art style, but definitely in what the art style has inspired, say, for example, in the um, Peter Jackson adaptation. Um, when I look at, you know, for example, the elven culture and their synergy with nature, for example, I do relate it more to Asian, um, you know, Japanese, mm. Chinese, Korean civilization um, than I do to Western civilization. And I think you're, you know, bringing up of the um, uh, these Japanese prints is important because, of course, Tolkien was a, um, a landscape painter. Um, a watercolorist, and I do feel that there is some sort of explicit connection or um, debt he paid to um, uh, to the the Japanese um, landscape um, uh, painters, especially um, Hokusai is probably the most famous one. Uh, there's also, if I go right to the end of uh, of this presentation, there's also um, a little thing which I want to draw up here, um, which ah. is the, the idea of the emblem in the Lord of the Rings, because of course you know we're very used to you know, heraldic devices, or what have you. Um, but within Tolkien's universe, um, heraldry in the Christian sense doesn't really exist. And instead, for example, the um, we have a Numenorean tile, and of course we have the um, the famous emblem of the Silmarillion here. And um, this is much more recent, and as you can see, doesn't really owe anything to Tolkien at all, but nevertheless it's inspired by him, which is the um, the recent book, The Fall of Gondolin, which was published only um, three years later, but I think really it's trying to pay more into the Game of Thrones aesthetic here. Um, mm. But nevertheless, when I think of the the imagery, the symbolism, the emblems of um, Lord of the Rings, I don't think of quintessential medieval Europe. I'm in fact drawn to these on the image here on the right hand side. Um, these are emblems of what the Japanese called mons, essentially you, Japan, you know, for most of its history until relatively recently, uh, was divided into various um, daimyo lord, uh, lordships, what have you. And um, each of these clans had a marker a symbol here, these um, these floral symbols. And um, I can't help but feel that um, to the talking aesthetic is somehow indebted to this idea of mm. um, the Japanese markers. So I don't th I think it runs beyond just um, the influence on landscapes and possibly the you know the, the latent interest or connection you draw to um, to the elves or what have you. Um, but I think even when you look at the Numenorians, I mean, looking at this image on the um, uh, on the left here at the bottom, um, one thought I had even was because if you look at the language, um, Numenorian is um, said to have some sort of Semitic origin. So I thought, you know, maybe is is this paying lip service to some sort of um, Arabic tradition? You know, maybe those um, yeah. um, the beautiful roofs of, say, for example, uh, the Alhambra or you know the um, the great mosque in Samarkand, etc. Yeah. But I thought, in addition to that, these um, Semitic ideas. I also thought um, these Japanese mons. Yeah, it's a it's a very very good point, and I, I would certainly agree that. Uh... I mean, I've been sort of repeatedly mentioning the, you know, the kind of influence of this medievalism, this European medievalism. But you're mm. right. I mean, it's extraordinarily tempered with, with, with something, you know, something else. I mean, something, something Eastern, as, uh, you know, as as you suggested. And I, I, uh, I sort of pull it, pull it, pull it, pull in with some other images. Uh, that Numenorean tile. I was actually going to include that, and I forgot. But. Uh, you know, another thing that was, you know, uh, in, quite in circulation in late 19th century, early, early 20th century was uh, um, this extraordinarily, extraordinarily kind of physical uh, cult culture of um, design and and uh, and the production yeah. of objects. So I, I, that that Numenorean tile reminds me of nothing more than Minton, uh, mm. what, what they called encaustic tiles. It was a very specific yeah. uh, uh method of producing tiles i i believe that uh, the ha, uh the lobby and the house of houses of parliament have uh are, the floor is is mint and in, in caustic tiles i believe they're extensively used in uh in putin's uh buildings so uh 
so yes, I mean that, and that would again be something that um, that Tolkien would have would have would have been aware of. I mean, it would have been in the air. So, uh, and and I do think that then again, as you say, that the 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 kind of Arabic, um, you know, Isnic uh, ceramics and things like that were were kind of pollinating the, you know, the the Minton aesthetic and and would certainly have, have filtered through again. I mean. It, was this extraordinary period? I I think the nineteenth century and and the early twentieth century of of this just huge cross pollination of kind of histories and, and and cultures and you know visual languages uh, and and so you know which I think also is 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 in the end what the uh, le- the legendarium uh, turns out to be. You know? uh, and it was yes, certainly I... is a, a major kind of uh, feeling I get from. From, from that yes I'll hold off on the the Arab influences I think in in the calligraphy but um uh, certainly looking to this there's just one point I want to make which obviously you know looking at the the history of art in the Catholic world in particular the counter-reformation and even the medieval world um I can't help but again f- figure that most of the art tends to focus around you know not just um, landscapes, not just um, uh, these sort of um, floral esque motifs, but also um, portraiture, sculpture in particular. And yet, there is very little of that in Tolkien. And um, I find that rather interesting because when I think of cultures with an absence of um, uh, human sculpture, um, I tend to think of the iconoclastic cultures and, mm. in particular, Arabic culture. Yes, I mean, I I do wonder that sort of strain of uh, that's if if that strain of iconoclasm has because of course that's why I mean you know if people aren't familiar that's why I think the the calligraphic and the design arts flourish so mm. much in uh, is, Islamic societies because you know, there was a prescription of upon depending on where you were and what what time period but there was a general prescription on depicting uh you know depicting even animals at certain points so. Yes. You know, a, a lot of these energies had to go into other ways of kind of creating a, 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 an art and a visual language, which of course was calligraphy and uh, and patterning, and and of course those things were, um, you know, became very influential uh, as again in the uh, in the late nineteenth century. Yes, absolutely, and um, and just for reference, um, when when D is referring to uh, particular times, yes, there were. Um, in the early modern period, in particular, when you have this this wonderful flourishing of um, Persian miniature painting, um, especially in the Mughal court, where special attention was played uh, was um, played to the the focus on portraiture in the faces, even though it was ostensibly an Islamic culture. So um, it has gone in and out of fashion, even within Muslim societies. But nevertheless, there is this emphasis, especially within early Islam, on iconoclasm. Uh, so now we arrive at this image, Mr. D. Yeah, so this is uh, Aubrey Beardsley, uh, an il- illustration from uh, from Aubrey Beardsley. I'm, I'm going to look in my notes here. I can't remember what particularly what this was, uh, what this publication was from. But I mean, Beardsley is another example of an illustrator um, working at uh, you know in the uh, in the very the sort of late nineteenth century, very much associated with Victorians. Um, and I, I detect a certain gain a certain influence on uh, maybe if not to- Tolkien specifically but certainly on the visual culture of the time and and and, and Beardsley again was was sort of imbibing these kind of uh eastern influences to some degree you know where people are familiar with art nouveau um which was a whole sort of movement of, of art and design mm-hmm. um associated with France but also present in Britain and elsewhere and uh, you know, uh, very much this this idea of of, of uh, generating sort of design and and decoration in art uh, through kind of botanical motifs, and it's something that really reminds me of of the Elven kind of yes culture and way of seeing the world, and I almost and, and and even in the the Peter Jackson films, I, I think that. Um, there is a very much a kind of almost Art Nouveau Beardsleyan kind of hint to that, you know, to their design yeah. and their architecture. Uh, 
and I, I do wonder if that was intentional. Uh, I, I've I've looked through lots of um, uh, Alan Lee's mm. uh, pr- production drawings, and uh, but yeah, I was, I was certainly curious about that. But the, you know, the, again, these were very much um, the tenor of the times. Um, yes. And for people who don't know, Alan Lee is one of the um, most famous and principal um, talking illustrators. <clears throat> uh, but definitely when we look at the um, uh, construction of, say, for example, Rivendell, um, I do sort of believe that the Art Nouveau influence is tangible. And of course, I do sort of believe that, you know, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Art Nouveau, roughly sort of the inception of it is around 1880 um, through to about 1910. Um, I, I do believe that there is also some sort of even if it's not explicit, some sort of um, Asian influence on the Art Nouveau process, in, in part because of the interaction, especially because the um, Meiji restoration would have only happened you know, a couple of decades before. Um, do you think that's fair? I think I think that's certainly fair. Um, and uh, y- yes, and I mean, I, I wonder, you know, in fact, that almost seems to be uh, certainly visually something that came comes more, up more in the films. I mean, as we'll see later on, I have a uh, one of Tolkien's own watercolors of Rivendell, mm. and it's, it's very different in conception from, uh, you know, from the one the one in the film. Um, Wonderful. So moving on, we have, I believe, this is William Morris. Yes, this is a this is a tapestry uh, done by John Henry Dull, a company for Morris, Morris and Co. Um, and uh, you know, again, this speaks to the kind of revival of this um, this idea, this this sort of revival of of, of both the kind of medieval um, medieval ish visual world, and and also this extraordinary interest in kind of kind of botanical patterning uh, and 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 schemata, and and this is you know if you if you when you think about the way that Tolkien writes about the kind of natural world of the legendarium and 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 certainly as can be seen in many of his illustrations you know this this sort of uh i think pervading influence at the time is 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 visible uh you know in the work but uh you know i i'm also interested of course in, in that uh this was very you know the late 19th century was very much the age of kind of you know, it was it was it was it was not in as I said earlier, was not interested in kind of historical accuracy as much. It was it was interested in mm-hmm. influence and interpretation. You know, this is a, you know this. I mean, if you weren't if you weren't aware, you would perhaps mistake this for a you know a tapestry from a much earlier period. You know, yeah. There's al- almost an element of kind of uh, I don't think of a, of a word. I don't want to say fakery, but you know that there was this sense of kind of basically re reimagining the worlds of the, of the past in in a kind of uh, a kind of historically informed but fanciful way, and and it was certainly something that I, that would you know would certainly have been an influence on the development of a kind of fantasy writer. Uh, so. No, I think that's I think that's completely fair. I mean the. Um... The literary development of, of course you know we're talking about this um this reimagining the medieval world of course you know uh, a large sort of part of later german romanticism is essentially that um but relating this back to germany of course uh, mm. a couple of you know decades before tolkien we of course have the brothers Grimm, who in addition to being the great compilers of um german folklore and fairy tales um were of course philologists like tolkien focusing on the german language and so i i believe that you know that influence the 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 artistic trends and the literary trends all tending towards this um again because even focusing on Tolkien Tolkien um read these works he read history into these works and there is a um there is a rich sort of element of history you can read into the Lord of the Rings still and I think um the 19th century the later 19th century especially is this um a wonderful culmination of fantasy elements and this attempt to realize some form of the past even if it is um in some some way imagined um yeah. so moving on to here uh this is another william morris tapestry i also included a, a number of these morris things because uh tolkien had at least one book of morris's uh in his in his library yeah. uh, 
Um, so I, I can't remember which one. I think it was maybe Morris's book about symbols and and mm. and, and, and patterning. Um, it, it, you know, it was it was very much one of Morris's kind of uh, uh, explanatory textbooks. And uh, so yeah, so I do know that Morris would have been a you know a, an ident a real identifiable influence, or at least someone that Tolkien was you know was familiar with and was perhaps interested in. So. Uh, but no, I but think again, I mean, the, the, this, I uh, that, you know, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think that's, um, that's my reading of it, especially, I mean, even in the, um, uh, the various sort of architectural influences for, um, you know, I think it's William Morris's house and, um, and yeah. the Shire, I think, um, uh, there exists that, but I think, um, obviously William Morris is the, the height of the, the arts and crafts movements, um, movement in the UK. Um, I, I think the, the influence is tangible. And of course this is, you know, directly contemporaneous. I mean, most of um, uh, Tolkien's sort of formation period, you know, is around the First World War prior to it, um, which is really the height of William Morris. So I think, um, yes, it's very clear to, to me to sort of um, illustrate that direct connection to William Morris. Um, this uh, this um, painting in particular, I do get a, um, a, um, a Philip Veidt <laughs> uh, yeah. ring to it. Yeah. Um, you know, his, um, his, uh, epic images of Gamania in particular. Yes. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, I, 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 I could have, I, 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 I uh, thought about putting that in there. I'm not, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the kind of, uh, Germanic, um, strains of the, uh, you know, of this, of this time, but certainly like, you know, for everyone from Casper David Friedrich to, you know, onward would, would certainly also have been there. Um, I also, you know, I recently listened to your stream with Plumber about the sagas, and uh, you know, I, I was cur uh, very interested in that because it was again the kind of reintroduction of of a kind of an ancient text, mm. you know, that that but but that 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 came as new to a lot of people. You know, it it was it was really the first time that people would have experienced something that had been around for you know for, for centuries, and uh, and so there was an idea of even finding even the even the, the sort of ancient and old becoming new again at the time. Um, and uh, as you say, I mean, of course, the Germanic uh, and uh, other other cultures had a huge influence on, on Tolkien. Um, so. Well, I mean, thematically, that is, that is absolutely spot on, of course, because um, you know, what was, you know, one of Tolkien's sort of great passions, it was not just language creation, but language reconstruction. So when you're trying to find, you know, preceding languages when there is a lack of um, mm. uh, written records in particular, or there doesn't exist a oral tradition anymore. Um, a lot of philology is dedicated towards language reconstruction. So in Tolkien's case, it was literally rediscovering a, a form of the past to, to the best of his capabilities, essentially. Um, and here we have... Uh, yeah, this is William Morris. Um, William Morris had a, 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 a founded press called the Kelmscott Press. Um, in I believe 18, 1891, something like that, and uh, published quite a number of very very elaborate editions. This is the uh, this is the Kelmscott Ch uh, Chaucer, um, mm. which is a heavily heavily illustrated and designed book, um, and uh, and I think again would certainly have had a uh, had a profound influence upon upon the times. Uh, and 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 Tolkien probably saw this, but you know, it's very much the, it's very much the kind of I, the modern person's idea of of a kind of an ancient tome in a way. You know, it's it's uh, it's something that is that that has the air of, it has an ancient air about it, but is of course thoroughly kind of modern in its conception and the production. So, uh, very uh, very very curious book. Uh, but um, and also, you know, again, the, the the reference to Chaucer, you know, this sort of idea of weaving the tales of travelers uh, together, you know, uh, seem to have some pertinence to Tolkien, to me anyway. Oh, you're you're completely right, Mister D, because um, Tolkien was a professor of Middle English, and. Um, I believe there is a essay or article um, on Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, 
uh, there might be a translation of the Reeves tale, which is the third of the Canterbury Tales. Um, he definitely wrote extensively on it. And um, yes, there is a an essay, uh, Chaucer as a philologist. So if we have William Morris and Geoffrey Chaucer combined here, um, I think almost certainly Tolkien would have um, taken inspiration from this um, due to that specific overlap between those two inspirations. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> ah, excuse me. Um, yeah, hang on. Let me get my dates again. Um, yeah, and I, I think uh, it, also I'm quite interested in, of, of course, uh, I, I think by nature and politics, uh, Tolkien and Morris, I mean, they had they had these sorts of, I think, cultural affinities, but they were also kind of completely divergent characters in other ways. I mean, uh, 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 Morris, William Morris being heavily associated with kind of burgeoning socialist movement at the time and mm. Tolkien being you know, quite, quite different and, you know, and uh, much more of a explicit reactionary. So, uh, yeah, curious, uh, curious tendencies there. Uh, um, what about this um, this image in particular, or just um, a continuation from the sentiments of the previous slide? Yeah, it's, it's a, again just a continuation. There's another page from the uh, uh, from the Kelmscott Ch Chaucer. This is the uh, Wife of Bath tale, uh, but you can see this extraordinarily extraordinary um, kind of visual fullness um, and you know kind of pattern on pattern and, and using. Mm sort of symbols and decoration but also the incorporation of uh of, of of text and type uh within a design and and uh i think you know tolkien's keen interest in uh, philology and calligraphy and language as well as the kind of visual arts you know i mean that th this was a this was certainly a rife time for you know for that kind of flourishing of of a of a of a sort of uh, polyvalent uh, artistic approach to uh, you know to a work, so quite quite impressed by uh, by these uh, Kelmscott books. Absolutely, they're they're wonderful to look at. So moving on to um, this painting. So I, I want I wanted to put in a few images. This is um, uh, John. Uh, uh, Paul Nash, sorry, uh, and this was uh, just a, a sort of spring landscape from uh, about 1914. Um, very much in a kind of formative time for uh, uh, for Tolkien, but uh, I, I I I put these in here because I think there's also something that happened with uh, the imagining of the British landscape at the time with various artists. Um, mm. And, it, you know, uh, Paul Nash uh, was a war artist as well. And so I, I do think there's certainly a, a kind of connection there. I don't know if there was any kind of explicit contact between them, but, uh, you know, it's sort of like, very curious to me that both, uh, both Tolkien and Nash were, you know, had this sort of experience of both the kind of imagining of the landscape and also with with the you know the great war uh this is um another pair this is actually by um uh by nash as well um mm. but uh you know it, this there was also i would say British uh, painting of the period was, I would say, slightly less sort of adventurous than certain concomitant movements on the on the continent. But uh, yeah. there was a, a very slow trickle of kind of ideas of modernism. I mean, if you remember the Hokusai from a few minutes ago, uh, if people people think about those images and the way that he's actually kind of constructing a, a landscape from the far distance to, you know, to, to things very close up, especially yeah. um, noticeable in the second image. I mean, this, 
this kind of almost vertical arrangement of the landscape. And it, it's a very different way of sort of imagining space and imagining the arrangement of shapes and space. And, and uh, this, this is something I think that very clearly came through um, from the influence of, of kind of uh, Japanese art, which, which had the largest kind of influence on, uh, in, Brit in Britain, uh, because, you know, Britain's uh, um, contact with, uh, with Japan uh, yeah. uh, at, uh, in the Meiji period and all that. So, um, so I do think you, you start to see this kind of um, slight simplification and almost slight abstraction uh, yeah. uh, uh, being applied to something very traditional like British landscape, which of course is a huge subject. I mean, landscape is is traditionally one of the, I, I would say, one of the keen uh, and and uh, abiding subjects of, of British painters, sort of reaching its flowering in the you know the eighteenth century with with, with Constable and, and, and such uh, such artists. But uh, but you know, I think with 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 Nash and with uh, uh, Stanley Spencer and other artists of that, uh, you know, of the period, um, you, you see this this uh, this kind of influence and this new way of arranging the arranging the countryside, arranging the landscape, and arranging people and buildings and such within it that you see very explicit, explicitly in Tolkien's uh, watercolors, which we'll we'll see quite soon. Uh, this is uh, again, again just another paint. Uh, this is by John Nash, uh, laying for a quarry. This is a slightly later painting. This is, I think, nineteen fifties. But uh, yeah. you know, again, this almost kind of Cezanne-like uh, uh, ordering of uh, ordering of the landscape and the and the kind of distance becoming a vertical construction. Um, if you want to get to the next slide. This is uh, St Stanley Spencer, uh, another sort of very well-known uh, English artist at the time. Uh, but but again, the, the very particular kind of realities of, of what a British landscape was, just because because of the the nature of our you know of our uh, of the la uh, you know of the kind of landscape and lay of terrain here. Um, I think. Uh, Bear, bear a great influence on art at the time. Uh, and so ne next is, uh, this is actually Tolkien. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a very famous painting, but yes, I can definitely see uh, almost um, wonderfully set up the culmination um, of all of those influences which you've um, um, given us here. Um, would you like to elaborate? Yes, I mean, I, you know, so all, all those things I was sort of babbling about but you know the, the, the sort of uh, vertical arrangement this kind of piling and construction um this slight flattening you know so of course we think of the specifically the italian renaissance and the northern renaissance uh, as being this kind of discover also this, this discovery of uh, of how to do correct perspective and how to do atmospheric perspective you know this this great sort of idea of of kind of bringing the bringing the visual arts out of the kind of slightly naive uh, quote naive world of uh, you know of, of the Middle Ages and into the great flowering of the Renaissance and you know so so what's curious though of course is that as you know in the nineteenth century and certainly in the twentieth century uh, there was almost a kind of wholesale. Uh, not not rejection of that idea, but but this notion that there were other ways of kind of constructing an image that that vis that the that faithfulness to visual and optical reality isn't the be all and end all of creating an image. Mm. You know that that also, I mean, something lost I think in the in the humanism and rationalism of the Renaissance was this idea that that was certainly a huge part of image making in earlier periods and. In the medieval period, <clears throat> and in other cultures, obviously, in, as we we talked about Japan, the Orient, and, and such, I mean, this idea that images weren't just reflections of what you saw, but they were also, um, play, they were also conveyors of meaning, conveyors of yeah. kind of relationships and symbolic relationships, and and you know, kind of 
arcane knowledge and revelations of you know of religious revelations philosophical exploration you know, that that adherence only to the optical was not was not the most fruitful direction to go in art and so i think you did see this 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 great sort of searching for other other modes of expression and this would have appealed to tolkien greatly because of course as we see in all of his his work this huge um this huge sort of fondness and love for the kind of things under the surface you know for the meaning of of, of, of kind of symbols and the meaning of you know the kind of language of in, uh, inherent in nature and things like that all of which have nothing to do with this kind of scientific uh, you know kind of humanistic idea of 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 uh, the visual be you know the visual arts being just a reflection or a mirror of nature so uh, and i think that would have been great greatly meaningful to someone of tolkien's you know interests uh, so. well thank you for that summary mr d and this, of course, is the um, the original Rivendell um, before it's later um, uh, <laughs> um, enlarging as a result of Peter Jackson's. Um... <laughs> yeah, much, much yes. less of a much less of a grand, uh, much less of a sort of grand uh, imagining. I will say, I one I, I forgot to kind of <clears throat> mention that you know, although I've been talking so much about the British countryside, uh, one of the huge influences on Tolkien was was actually the Swiss. The landscape of Switzerland yes, and of the yes, Alps. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and that, um, in particular, just to to, to elucidate, um, I, I believe he holidayed in Switzerland. What was it? It would have been in 1911. And um, he later wrote that this was an incredibly formative experience. Um, essentially, he imagined that he himself had traversed the, up to the Lonely Mountain. He had been in the company of the um, of the dwarves and. Um, I think this this idea of trying to recreate um, that original um, holiday in Switzerland um, you know, is a motif that's running throughout you know, a lot of his works, and um, the obsession with with hills and mountains. So yes, in terms of Tolkien's direct experience, yes, and 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 of course uh, also there's the idea of of, of kind of you know that that different types of landscape reflect diff the different realities of the, of the races of Middle Earth and. You know that Mordor is the landscape of Mordor is is a you know is a reflection upon the character of, of those who live there, and then Rivendell would be a reflection of the character of the elves there, and Lothlorien would be a, it would be the same. Uh, yeah, and also of course the you know the, the Shire and and Hobbiton is is kind of home. I mean that is the kind of British countryside, and then of course I, as you sort of move out from that, you start to get these very different almost alien landscapes and and of course the landscape of the alps as we as we talked about which was, which was i think influential not only to his conception of rivendell but yeah as the lonely mountains the misty mountains and all of that so yes and i think um one of this you know the striking thing about this image is that it does convey a sentiment very similar to the previous image which of course was the um the the road that goes on and on towards the um towards back end and um i do sort of look at this image and feel you know it is home it is it is comforting to look at but um obviously in peter jackson's adaptation it's this is of course literally the house of elrond um it is much grander in conception more like a um a palace or some sort of lordly estate um which Perhaps you know if um, Lord of the Rings was a realized, you know, a, a fully conceived um, universe, it's probably more realistic. Um, but nevertheless, I think um, there is this parochialism to Tolkien's work, which um, I find very endearing, very comforting. So, yes, absolutely, and 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 which I think is 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 not entirely reflected in, of course, the design of. I mean, if you're making a, a you know kind of epic trilogy of films obviously you're going to have to kind of uh, have a have a sort of visual language that's going to hmm. it's going to reflect that but yeah I, I i certainly agree with you this idea of home uh, this 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 comforting idea of home and 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 all you know the again the idea that of all the the kind of pathways and such leading either home and away and i think you see that in there's so many of these talking images that are sort of bisected or transversed by a path hmm. or a a road or a stream or something there's 
there's always something to draw you from the foreground into the into the far distance and and back again uh to steal a steal a phrase there so yeah um and so this is um uh bill but this would be more from the uh the the hobbit but uh I mean, I see an extraordinarily, extraordinary relationship between the game this and those those Paul uh, and John Nash uh, kind of watercolors of time, um, and also you know the kind of the uh, what would be called the uh, the sublime. Uh, so if you think of uh, again, think back to the nineteenth century um, uh, in America, it's sort of associated with America actually. Uh, is, is the is the notion of the kind of like the Hudson River School painters this this sort of painting of the of the landscape as a representation of of the sublime of the kind of awesome and unknowing nature of of, uh, of kind of God and God's creation and hmm. and there's always a kind of placement of man within the the sort of vastness of uh, the the landscape and and of course in the case of the hobbits I mean. They were really literally dwarfed by <laughs> almost everything <laughs> that they encountered, you know, as they moved away from from the Shire. So, uh, so I think that the sublime is also kind of entering into into this visual world as well. Uh, this is uh, just a watercolor of um, uh, Lothlorien from Tolkien. Um, Again, I mean, as you see, it's very different in conception. I mean, in Peter Jackson's imagination of, of uh, uh, and the production designer's imagination of Lothorian, I mean, it's a very different place. And there's very mm. much a kind of sense, I mean, even with great personages like Galadriel and Celeborn and, and, uh, and, and such, uh, there is always a kind of sense of, of connection to the earth and in a kind of human scale, maybe, if that's not an exaggeration, uh, that of course you don't get in the film. I think they're, they're much more, there's much more of a kind of grandness and aloofness to the, to the design of, uh, you know, of, of, the, of these various places, certainly the elf places in, in the film. So. Absolutely. But I think um, just looking at this picture, I still do get um, this idea of grandeur and, you know, serenity but also there's almost like a timeless aspect to this um picture and in particular galadriel is an immortal be being and if anything she represents the the endurance of this idea of some sort of um you know relationship between sentient beings and nature um i think in galadriel that's probably the most exemplified i think um if i were to look at um peter jackson i think he retains elements of that. I mean, Lothlorien, you know, the, the elfin doom, which is, you know, uh, which is Lothlorien is um, still wedded to this idea of, you know, harmony with nature, albeit, in, as you mentioned, in a far grander and ostentatious manner than mm. is conceived of here. Um, so yes, moving on. And was, this, of course, is the, um, I believe, the entrance to Moria. Yes, the, uh, the entrance to Moria. I... We also quite like this because if you see in the middle of the water that that tentacle uh, poking up, um, the watcher, the watcher in the water, yeah, I mean, just that that hint of danger uh, mm. uh, there. But um, you know, so I, I'm struck by how much um, you know. Uh, I, I think that the kind of vision of Moria, the uh, the exterior of Moria uh, in the film, is very close to this. You know, obviously much more kind of rusticated, but uh, you know, so there there are kind of times where they're they're quite um, quite uh, faithful to I I, I I would say Tolkien's vision uh, than others. If you're making a comparison to the film, um, yes, and this image is is wonderful. It does um, conjure up a sense of um, foreboding doom. You know, both in the water, <laughs> but also in the mountains above. Yeah. And in the um, the impenetrability of the mountains, this is the case with um, all of these um, uh, dwarven cities. Um, there's just one thing I wanted to know: um, How do you rate Tolkien's competence as an artist? Um, I would say that he's um, he's fairly advanced. I would say he's a fairly advanced 
amateur. I mean, there's certain there's certain weaknesses that I see in the images that you know again would be uh, you know are just the hallmarks of someone who who doesn't have explicitly sort of the technical training that would be required to pull some of these things off. Um, I think that there's extraordinary sophistication in others, you know, the images. I mean, again, he's someone who I think if, if he'd pursued visual arts uh, as his sort of main focus, it would have, be, you know, he would have been, he, he would have risen above the uh, the kind of, uh, the kind of world of the amateur, you know, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm, again, because it's him and because of course, the idea of seeing this world that he, you know, this world of his creation through his own visions of it, you know, put down on paper, I'm willing to forgive some of the slight kind of technical issues uh, with with some of the images. So. Yes, and of course, um, I think I think Tolkien can be forgiven. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to see mediocrity because that there is, I would say, you know, um, definite talent in here. But um, you know, Tolkien would truly be a Renaissance man if, on top of all of this, he was um, a a superlative artist. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> and as I said, I mean, he's you know he's well advanced of of j just your sort of average, you know, your average person. Certainly, certainly yes. the average output of many writers that I've seen delve into the visual art. So, uh, um. So yes, yeah, so I, I I think again, had he had he had he focused on that and developed it, I mean, he certainly could have could have been quite uh, you know or quite competent professional. Wonderful, and here we are faced with one of um, the great eagles. Yes, which is uh, uh, again uh, the the sort of relationship of the of the landscape to the figure um, is is just something I re I really like so much. I don't know if it's Specifically, what what this scene is, uh, because that appears to be, um, I, I don't know if that's Frodo or Bilbo there, um, but uh, you know, it, uh, certainly uh, the production designers for Peter Jackson's uh, kind of kind of would have would have been aware of this uh, this point. I'm almost sort of um, I believe there's some sort of Beatrix Potter esque image, especially in the um, mm. the rendering of the eagle. I know Beatrix Potter was um, a significant influence, especially because you know yeah. Tolkien was illustrating for his children. That should be emphasised. You know, he wasn't um, um, there was an amateurish quality because he wasn't doing this professionally, of course. And um, you know, when look at his non-associated um, paintings with the Legendarium, um, it is with this idea of um, again appealing to children and writing and illustrating for children's books um of course he did submit many of his own um, illustrations to the hobbit i believe the publisher uh, rejected the majority of them but um <laughs> yeah they were found their way they, into um yeah they were all rejected at first i mean certainly for the yeah. first editions uh i think only a, a couple of maps and um, uh, maybe a couple of calligraphy uh even even in the lord of the rings uh uh in the in the first edition, so um, yeah, he was uh, he was he was overruled. It, it is remarkable, actually, so looking at the um, the history of the publications, especially with the Lord of the Rings, because um, uh, the Hobbit was more of a um, a happy accident for um, mm. uh, for, for Ronald Tolkien, but um, with the Lord of the Rings, especially, it is remarkable um, looking at how utterly sort of scathing and um, <laughs> underwhelmed they were by the project, <laughs> um, and of course, here we have. One of the most famous illustrations of Smaug. I do I have a version? I, I think I have a copy of that somewhere. <laughs> I should know. Um, but anyway, obviously, this is one of the most you know iconic um, images you know, from Lord of the Rings. If you haven't sort of, um, uh, if you're not familiar with the with the films, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I am actually quite unfamiliar with the Hobbit films. I only saw one of them, uh, so. Uh, so I'm not particularly sure how how, how uh, the depiction of Smog uh, held up in those, but um... yes, I think um, I, I mean I can't remember because I was I, at one point I was you know following the um, uh, making of the Hobbit films with um, with great interest, and um, I believe there was supposed there was supposed to be two of them, not three, 
and yeah. um, they had a, a a different director. I can't remember um, who it was, but um, the idea, I believe, was that um, there's supposed to be an entirely different aesthetic to The Hobbit to match the tone. And of course, they ended up just getting Lord of the Rings two. Essentially, it's Lord of the Rings prequel. Essentially, The Hobbit. It um it doesn't have the same tone as the book. Um, and of course, as it is Peter Jackson, it is um envisages as you know grand Lord of the Rings as epic. And I think because of that, I um I don't rate The Hobbit, especially from an aesthetic point of view, because I do just see it as a continuation of Lord of the Rings. You know, I'm, I'm far more sort of enticed by an image such as this, as opposed to the um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch rendition of Smack. <laughs> yes. Well, also, I think it, it, it kind of mischaracterizes the, the tone of The Hobbit, which, of course, yes. has... It just, it just has a very different feel, the book, the book certainly, from, from that film. You know, they try to make a kind of Le, Le Grand epic, uh, you know, and it, it just it, it isn't quite the character of the book. So, uh, incidentally, it was meant to be uh, Guillermo, Guillermo de, Tor del Toro. Toro, yes, yes. Director that's, who, the, that's the name um, I was trying to think of. And I, I get the, I mean, I got the impression from the one Hobbit film that I saw that Peter Jackson's heart wasn't in it. You know, it just it just seemed like he it, it it wasn't the kind of project of a lifetime that the Lord of the Rings was for him. No, I, I suspect so. No, and I don't want to fault <clears throat> Peter Jackson at all. I mean, um, I, I may you know occasionally throw dispersions at the um at the adaptation we've got, but in hindsight, I say that the Lord of the Rings adaptation we got certainly was um the best possibly conceivably we could have ever got. Um, when it comes to the the Hobbit, I'm less forgiving, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would much I would much prefer a, a, a single film, a single two hour film, which um, yeah. match the um, uh, the tone of the of the book. But um, uh, nevertheless, yeah. here we are. But um, focusing on the the actual sort of um, image it, itself, <laughs> um, is there anything you would like to elaborate? Well, I, I'm I'm struck by the, the slightly comical nature of of, of the dragon. You know, I mean, he, he, you know, I mean, obviously, I think it's in keeping so much with uh, as what we were talking about with the tone of the book. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's it's less the kind of horror of the, you know, kind of ring wraith or, you know, and it's it's more this slightly kind of fairy tale dragon, um, you know. So it's interesting, really, isn't it? Because of course the. Um... The influence there are there are two sort of influences for this. One is of course Nimhog, which is the um, you know the dragon at Ragnarok, the um, the stealer of souls. But the, of course the other influence is um, uh, Fafnir, the um, the troll transformed into a dragon on his um, hoard of gold. And um, I find it interesting how Tolkien is able to take a a rather intimidating creature such as Fafnir. Um, who is often the object of, um, you know, especially, you know, Siegfried or whatever, um, slaying the dragon. And here there's almost the inversion of that because, of course, um, Bilbo is not a great warrior and will never be. And instead we have this um, you know, wonderful conversation, which is you know, one of my favourite parts of the book. And um, I think Smaug is drawn to reflect that. Yes. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, I mean, it's, it, uh, again, some sort of a slightly, I don't know, I wouldn't say comical character, but um, you know, there there is a sort of sense of, of sense, of, I don't know, humor or lightness or something. Playful subversion, perhaps. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Um, you know, that that of course is missing from the kind of po-faced uh, Cumberbatchian. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I mean the. The dragon iteration we got in the Peter Jackson version is supposed to be horrifying and intimidating, and um, of course, within this conception, he would still be to to Bilbo, who will be awed and terrified by um and is by Smaug, uh, yeah. but nevertheless, this is a um an iteration which is far more in keeping with um with the tone, which is something we um will will keep banging on, but um yeah. nevertheless, uh, and this was an interesting edition. This is the um. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the Latin. Sadly, I've got I've got a very bad throat at the moment. Uh, okay, but this is yeah. <laughs> this is the hip hip, hip, hip narrow polypoli. Um, uh, I'm not uh, not uh, that's just the way I've always pronounced it. But uh, I'm sure it's 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 done in a way. Um, but this is a book published in 1499. Uh, 
possibly by Francesco Colonna, but um, the authorship is not known to certain. I mean, this is a very, very well-known book, uh, mm. printed by the the, 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 the Aldine Press of, of, Al, of Aldo, of Aldus Minutius. Uh, and uh, if people aren't familiar with it, you should really go out and kind of look into it, because it's a really fascinating book. And anyone sort of interested in uh, the idea of, of kind of esoteric knowledge and symbology and and sort of uh, mystical allegory, um, I think would be very interested in this uh, in this work. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that? Um, so it, it's a, I mean the the, the title means some, something like the the dream of, of Polyphilus or the the strife of love in a dream. I think it's, it's often rendered. Um, and it, it basically is the sort of telling of ostensibly of a dream, but it's very much a kind of highly arcane allegorical journey of the protagonist, um, Polyphily, uh, or Polyphilo, um, as he pursues, amongst other things, love through a kind of fantastical landscape and a fantastical world and uh, you know i put this in i mean it's just my conjecture i don't know i'm sure that tolkien would have been familiar with this although i don't know to what extent like i can't be sure of that but you know there's so many kind of parallels to many of the things we see in in tolkien's imagination of the of the legendarium and and uh, and such. I mean, the interest again in, in symbol, the interest in 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 kind of fantasy, in, constru in constructing a world, in in the in the world as kind of allegory, a religious mm. allegory and philosophical allegory um, of of the idea of kind of landscape and travel being being also kind of laden with meaning in a certain way. And um, you know, and. I think it's sort of added on top of that is that we don't actually know really what the nature and quote true meaning of this work is. Uh, so I, I, I certainly see it as a kind of precedent uh, for the, at least for, if not specifically for Tolkien, but certainly for the type of work um, that, that he, he produced. Well, I'm going to um, probably add my 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 mandatory Wagner reference for one stream, oh, yeah. and I do think, um, based on my my limited knowledge of it, um, I do think there is an illusion you can draw between the Venusburg in Tannhäuser uh, to the Fountain of Venus in um, uh, Polyphilio. So um, <laughs> that's just my one little Wagnerian chip there. Yeah, but. I... Um, it's a wonderful yeah. illustration of that fountain in, in this work. I mean, this work, it, it's not just a kind of literary work, but it's also the the, the Aldine edition is completely full of yeah. the most the most beautiful um, woodcut illustration you could possibly imagine. Um, and just for reference, this would be about 500 years old. Yeah, I think it was published uh, in 1499. Um, and... Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's. I mean, again, it, it, you know, it was, it's it's certainly been well known throughout history. I believe uh, uh, Francois Rabelais mentions it in um, Gargantua and Pantagruel. I mean, it was it was certainly known at the time, and and uh, and I think remained remained known, if not um, again. I think because it's so kind of arcane and and um, and strange and and difficult. To place in kind of history in literary history otherwise uh i think that um you know it's it's uh it's always been a kind of a you know maybe not the most famous thing but i'm certainly known to people uh, uh of a kind of literary artistic event um so i've included some some images from uh uh from the hypnerotomachia um sort of i'm i'm just sort of Doing a very heavy-handed comparing contrast to certain Tolkien images. So, if you go to uh, uh, that, yeah, I mean, so this is an image from um, from the Hypnerotomachia, and then of course the next image is uh, 
is is a is is a, is a Tolkien illustration. I mean, his his ink drawings are uh, are very different in character. I would say his watercolor paintings. Uh, they're very much more kind of uh, as, uh, in, within a sort of graphical, a decorative graphical tradition. I think they're very mm. interesting to draw the to draw these comparisons. Uh, the next is uh, drawing is also another Tolkien uh, drawing. Again, and you know. Ne- Notice in almost every one there there is a path forward, you know. Yes. Uh, whether it's and and sometimes it's accessible, and sometimes, of course, as in Moria, it's blocked by the formidable mountain and by the mm. by the gate of Durin, and and here, of course, blocked by the the broken you know the broken um, bridge or docks and and such. But it's it's a it's a kind of fascinating thing. I mean, to you know, just someone who who was so sort of enchanted by this idea of the, of, of, of the hero's journey. Um, the next image is another one from the uh, Hypnerus Machia. And, uh, you know, the sort of ruins of the obelisk. Uh, and, um, and so I sort of put that with, uh, with the next, those Frodo um, sitting amongst the, uh, Oh dear, what was that place called? Uh, so this would be um, Frodo traveling through Attilian. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is on the on on the east bank of um, Nero's Gilead. If I, I can't remember the the exact place, um, but this is where the um, uh, uh, flowers are growing on the statue of the king. Of the king, um, yes. yeah. I'll and one, and, and again, one of the I'll few. Probably, one of the probably, few... Hold, I'll look us up while you're talking because it's going to irritate me that I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it, and, and again, back to a point you made, it's one of the few kind of uh, appearances of, of human sculpture, you know, kind of memorial sculpture. Uh, and also the, the uh, you know, uh, sailing between the two monumental, uh, uh, monumental sculptures of the king uh, as well. So. Yes, I think um, when you do see statue and imagery, it is very explicitly associated with men and not just men, the Numenorians. So the, um, the, the Rohirrim, for example, again, a lot of elements of Tolkien are rather anachronistic. If you look at it within some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of true to life, you know, medieval, um, you know, reenactment or whatever, especially in the um, uh, the Jackson version, because the Gondor we see in the Lord of the Rings is is almost early modern in terms mm. of the aesthetic, in terms of the architecture, in terms of the clothing or whatever. Um, however, if you go to Rohan, uh, the aesthetic is almost um, very early medieval, late Dark Age. Yeah. Um, so elements of that are anachronistic, but. Um, one consistent element is, you know, whether you're, you know, you're at Amon Hen or in Athelion, because of course, you know, the um, one aspect of Tolkien's work is, of course, is the decay of man, the fall of man, and you know, obviously the renewal and the anointing of Aragon and the um, the rechristening and reunification of the kingdom. Um, but you see elements of this. Essentially, the ruin of um, the kingdom of the kingdom of men, the kingdom of Dubnor, um, appearing as a recurring motif throughout, you know, not just the books but also the films, and um, so you know, this is tangible in this image. This the sense of decline, the sense of fall. You know, of course, this area which um, Frodo was in, he's in the midst of um, enemy territory. Um, he's taking the ring to um, uh, Minas Morgul. Which used to be Minas Arnor, which of course was another outpost of Gondor, mm. which has been corrupted and um, used now as um, the headquarters of um, uh, the Witch King of Angmar, the Lord of the Nazgul. Um, but just focusing on the statues, I do think it's interesting that you have this element, particularly associated with one race and none of the others, and how you know the, 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 there is no such you know. Uh, similar motif recurring in, in the elves. Again, I'm not quite sure what um, uh, Tolkien is trying to convey. I mean, one of the elements I've read into Lord of the Rings, and I've, I think I've mentioned it on my stream with um, uh, Nathan Hood a very long time back, um, is that there is a, um, 
an idea that Numenor, at some point Arnor, um, the, the United Kingdom men, um, represented some form of the fall of the Roman Empire. And when you're looking at Minas Tirith, if you're looking at the last remnant of it, or even not that, you're looking at some sort of um, bastard remnant of it, some sort of rump state, essentially. And um, all you're left with is the constant reminder of the, the greatness of this once um, you know, powerful kingdom. And I think um, that's perfectly encapsulated in this image. Yes, and, and I, I think it's also notable that, I mean, as when you, whenever you see uh, in, the, in, in the films, and I referenced in the book as well, but whenever you do see this kind of more, more complex sculpture and more complex manifestations of, of certainly the kingdom of men it's always presented as as a ruin it, as, it's a ruin of the past a relic of the past uh you know statues of men are always kind of weathered or broken um or the you know again the the, the remnants of the new Minorians. um the, there's almost a kind of sense that you know you you know as you said living in this 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 era of, the, of uh, decline and decay where there isn't, you know, there isn't sort of nothing new, you know, and there is nothing sort of being produced. There is nothing sort of grand being put up. It's it's a civilization living off the ends of uh, the, the sort of the sort of memory of of, of, of times past. So, uh, and that's a very much a romantic idea, you know, that I think uh, I think certainly pervades perhaps some Tolkien sensibilities by that. And this, of course, is um, another illustration from the. Um... <coughs> Again, to try and pronounce it. Hypnerotomachia. Um, Hypnerotomachia polyphily. Yes. Uh, polyphily. You know, I mean, yes. Yeah, the literal li literal dragon there, which uh, I, was, I was quite taken by. Um, and uh, so the next image is also from Hypnerotomachia. Um, and. Uh, choose basically sort of choosing or choosing a way forward and you of course see the mm. the kind of pairing of the paths with these inscriptions in, in greek and latin and arabic and hebrew and this struck me so much as as it, with its relationship to the next image which of course yes, is one of the most absolutely. famous uh which is the is the um the gate the of the uh, to moria yeah yeah moria uh, which is faithfully represented in the film. I mean, they use, and this is Tolkien's design. I reversed it. I mean, so one of the humorous anecdotes about uh, Tolkien's attempt to get his illustrations in the first editions of uh, the Lord of the Rings book is that they allowed this. This is, I believe, one of the only one of the only one of his drawings that was was, was published in the first edition. Uh, but he wanted it to be published like this, which is white lines and uh, against the black uh, background, and uh, they wouldn't do it because it was too expensive. So it it appears it appears uh, inverted from this. It appears it's just a regular line drawing in that in that edition. Mm. But uh, but uh, Tolkien wanted it to be like this because, of course, it's uh, it's the the uh, the engraving on the door is chased in. Um, is chased in mithril uh by by elven hands and so of course this idea that it, it sort of glows with this light in the in the moonlight um, yeah. but so uh, you know again i mean this is a sort of heavily uh drawing on uh but i'm both sort of uh, well on uh on, on language and, and script and calligraphy but also upon arcane symbols i mean this is you know almost uh, uh almost an, an emblem uh, an emblem in the old sense of a of a kind of illustration uh with very specific allegorical program um so no that's fascinating thank you um so moving on to the next image um and this is my last little take out from the hypnerotomachia there's there's a, a number of uh, quite elaborate um, sort of uh, uh, not. I mean, this is almost like a Celtic knot. Uh, very elaborate sort of mm. um, uh, calligraphic designs of, of symbols and emblems. Uh, and this is 
as you talked about early in the stream with um, Tolkien's illustration of of the kind of uh, the kind of heraldry uh, that that we see in the Legendarium, uh, and with the yeah, the yes, the Numenorean tiles and all of that. I mean, uh, th this idea of, of, of kind of a a very very non European way of the, of depicting. These, this this kind of symbology, this kind of heraldry, um, and throughout lots of Tolkien's notebooks and drawings, there are I would say almost sort of obsessive uh, interest in drawing patterns and designs, uh, and I, I think also of the Silmarils and, and such. I mean, all of that was I, I descended from this type of kind of line work. Um, so if you go to the next one, this is one of the one of the many, many drawings um, in uh, in Tolkien's uh, in Tolkien's papers of, uh, uh, of of his sort of interest in in kind of of, of patterning, meaningful pattern, let's say. And what would you? Cause I, I mean, this image is is incredible. But um, other than you know, elucidating the the obvious use of the the Tengvar. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on what these possible patterns could mean? I don't. Um, I don't actually know. I mean, what specifically the the relationships here? I mean, again, I think so much. I mean, that it, it sort of has, I, I would say, classical precedence with the kind of patterning you see in in certain periods of Greek art, and certain even sort of then into the kind of Roman patterning, but also back to the Islamic, you know, this idea of kind of depicting uh, the mysteries of creation and God through, rather than depicting, you know, sort of humans and animals, sort of depicting that through th this kind of almost meditative pattern. And you see this mm. in so many kind of religious traditions, you know, this idea of kind of uh, sim sort of symbols of meditation, the sort of repetition and the kind of complexity that you could you know, that your eye gets lost in. Um, and uh, you see, there were just so many, looking through Tolkien's uh, visual artwork, I mean, there was so much of this. Um, the next slide is especially amusing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I was very, I was very um, in, intrigued to hear you talk about this one, Dave, when I first saw this. Um, so please, please do elaborate. <laughs> this is obviously a... Um, it's a page from the time. a crossword possible. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a crossword puzzle from the Times, uh, and again, this is just amongst Tolkien's papers. But you know, I mean, I don't know if he was um, if he was having maybe having it during the midst of a conversation, uh, mm. maybe he was on the telephone um, and doing this sort of thing. I mean, we've all probably done this type of doodling, but of course, in Tolkien's case, it's very sort of uh, majestically ordered and very specific and. Uh, and you could see, I mean, to me, the, the most fascinating thing is, of course, the kind of drawing out of this type of patterning from a puzzle, you know. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a crossword puzzle, I mean, it, it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of cipher. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it's a cipher with a hidden meaning, which you sort of draw out as you step through you know the, the 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 trials presented to you with each clue, uh, and 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 the interconnect. You know, and then you get this sort of series of interconnected words. And you know, and and to me, it's just sort of fascinating that Tolkien is maybe not consciously, but he's making a kind of uh, a kind of connection between this idea of a, of the kind of puzzle of words and the kind of puzzle of symbols. Um, and and very literally, and of course, the case of the uh, of the adverts around the puzzle. I mean, he's sort of blotting out literal type, blotting out words with, you know, with these uh, these very incessant patterns and symbols. Which, of course, again, you you see bits and pieces of this show up with like well, like with the, the Silmarils or that Numenorean tile and such. So uh, th this greatly interested me you know, to see this because, of course, it's not specifically yeah, you know, these weren't done for kind of public consumption. This is this is Tolkien thinking mm. and drawing. Um, and, you know, this is very much the kind of work of a mind in private, which uh, I think is very telling. 
Well, there are many elements to this. I mean, um, I, I will admit to doing doodles, not necessarily on the um, the scale or complexity of this, um, but nevertheless doing um, these rather extravagant doodles. Of course, um, the idea of the Hobbit was um, conceived of via a doodle when he was marking papers. <laughs> marking uh, but, papers, um, other, yeah. Yes, but other elements of this, um, obviously, you, know, you mentioned ciphers, of course, um, during the Second World War, Tolkien was earmarked as a potential code breaker. So that should um, come as no surprise to, um, to, to anyone. Another element, of course, is that um, he um, secretly communicated to his wife, Edith, while he was um, in France during the First World War, uh, using a form of code. And again, this plays into the idea that, you know, with um, uh, Nod Bosch, you know, the nonsense languages, he invented it um, at um, uh, King Edwards, etc. And moving on to, um, you know, Teng Var and all of these you know, complicated, you know, systems of alphabets and languages, etc. Um, it makes complete sense that you see this uh, element of um, talking the cold break, uh, code breaker, uh, talking the um, the puzzle solver, and talking the doodler, all sort of um, demonstrated in this piece. So, um, uh, thank you for showing it for uh, showing 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 this D. Um, Altogether, yeah, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, um, yeah. we have one of the most famous. I mean, this is of course the the original the the version i've used as the thumbnail of course is um is a later coloring but um this is the original yes i mean these uh, these drawings i mean there's others in this series with that, that have been sort of greatly kind of fleshed out and, and elaborated uh but uh but you know essentially these were tolkien's design um and and his conception of uh you know, of a, a lot of things, certainly with Hobbit architecture. And, and of course, we, we all know that Peter Jackson was extraordinarily faithful to this vision of the, uh, although the scale is, uh, is slightly, uh, slightly grander than I think the film scale of, uh, Bag End in the film, uh, mm -hmm. film version. But, um, uh, you know, but, <laughs> but again, there's, I, 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 I wasn't thinking about it, but even in this image, you know, the way forward, Door is open yes, and the path precisely. extends in, into the distance. I, I, it, it's fascinating how how many of these images that comes up. The road goes ever <laughs> on, <laughs> on, out of the door. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, okay, hang on. Yeah, my computer has gone to sleep at a very inopportune time. There we go. Uh, this is the halls of uh, halls of Manway, um, uh, a drawing by uh, Tolkien. I thought this was quite uh, uh, quite in, quite interesting because, of course, it's um, it's. Um, A very different conception of of a landscape. I would say much more kind of uh, fantastical. Um, and uh, I I don't know. Um, it's I sort mean, of in, the the upper and lower world uh, in a very yes. In terms in in terms of law, um, this is um, uh, Taniquetil, uh, which is supposed to be the the highest mountain in all the world. Um, and this, of course, is the, as you mentioned, this is the dwelling place of um, uh, of Manwe, uh, who is one of the one of the greatest of the Ainur. Um, so I think within Tolkien mythology of all the of the mountains, you know, this is the most illustrious of all of them. Mm. Was Manwe the was was Manwe the the um, Ainur associated with kind of craft? I can't. I can't. No, Manwe was associated with um, air. Aule was concer um, Aule, concerned with yeah. crowns, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there's um, certainly um, re representations of kind of uh, some of the some, some of the lore that we get later on in the, the kind of posthumous work, Silmarillion and, mm. and such. Uh, I'm also struck by the, uh, the swan boat there. Uh, it's Really <laughs> making me think of Wagner again. Uh, <laughs> we have to add a little um, a Lohengrin reference here, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but no, um, it, it is 
uh, it is quite incredible. And of course, um, confusingly, um, of course, you mentioned posthumously, um, most of the Silmarillion, of course, was written long, long before the Lord of the Rings. Um, so rather, it would have been the the original Silmarillion, which would have inspired, you know, the world of the Hobbit rather than, you know, um, vice versa. Right. Versa. Um, I, yeah. I, 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 again, I'm just sort of thinking of it in terms of publication. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely, it's, yeah. it's a bit like the saga, you know, a bit like I was talking about the sagas, you know, it's a, it's it's a basically a precedent that 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 sort of you know almost appeared new <laughs> to to those who who didn't know of it you know to the uninitiated uh <laughs> you know it was it was the it was the secret source of all of the uh the world of uh, the legendarium that we didn't get until after Tolkien's death so right um. Ah, yes, okay. Um, so this, I can't quite read the that annotation at the top. It's, this is all thank, obviously. Um, mm. uh, at first, I thought it was um, because of the uh, that structure at the top. Um, I thought it was the, the tower of where the uh, where the eye is, which Tolkien... Barador. Barador, yeah, yeah uh, which Tolkien did draw in a roundabout way but um this is sort of uh, again something curious to compare to the design of Orthanc uh that we see in the Peter Jackson films um mm. and uh um but you know it's, it's Tolkien's sort of imagination of the uh, of the architecture I mean the, the you know and of course the it, it is these designs of of, of Orthanc and uh, the structures in Mordor that you see bits and pieces of in, in Tolkien's drawings that that are I mean they absolutely dwarf everything else in his conception I mean even the elven sort of structures if you think back to like Rivendell so uh, there's a very clear kind of um, emphasis of the strength of of, of of the temporal strength of the powers of evil through their yes you know, through their you know, even even though, of course, all thank did begin as a as a symbol of evil, it certainly became. It. Well, I think um that's an interesting motif, though, isn't it? I mean, all thank, of course, was a Gondorian building, albeit the architecture of all thank in um Peter Jackson is completely dissimilar from anything else we see Gondorian. I think the architecture yeah. is fantastic, but it is invariably evil. That is the that is the yeah. Um, yeah. impression you get from the from the beginning. Uh, but that is the case for you know many of the towers, because of course there are so many towers. I mean, um, one of the frustrations of Tolkien when conceiving the title Two Towers, because of course it went through many um, uh, revisions of various titles, uh, was that it wasn't precise. Did it refer to um, Orthanc and Baladur? Did it refer to um, Baradur and Minas Tirith? Did it refer to Orthanc and Kirith Ungol, which of course is the um, the tower which um, Bilbo is um, you know, imprisoned in? Hmm. Um, because there's there's a slight you know, a, a different organization. <laughs> the Kirith Ungol is the end of Twin Towers, not the middle of um, Return of the King. Um, but the recurring theme, of course, is that these are all man-made structures, but they all progressively become corrupted. So Orthanc is corrupted. Um, and of course, the most famous example is uh, Minas Arnor um, becomes um, Minas Morgul. Morgul. Um, all of these sort of great, um, you know, towering structures that represent temporal power, one by one, are corrupted. And aesthetically, I think that is a motif which mirrors the idea of total power as exemplified in the Ring as being all corrupting. Yes, and and and, and again, it's very sort of sort of fascinating because, of course, there's an implication that you know that that architecture can be both literal buildings a physical thing but also the architecture of you know of the world of man it, you know also becomes kind of corrupted by by darkness and evil and and also crumbles through ruin you know um and very sort of very very uh, specific attempt to kind of make that parallel uh yes, which, which also i think carries through to the films too they they they, they didn't let that lapse Yes, a lot of um, Ozymandias esque sort of vibes yeah. going on. <laughs> Lone and the, the the stretches away. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so and um, the, the last sort of specific thing I wanted to touch on is uh, Tolkien's very keen interest in cartography, uh, the design of 
uh, of the of the world and the kind of mapping of the world that he's created was a, was an abiding interest of, in his. Uh, th- this is actually not a, a map per se. This is um, a uh, hang on. I know that. Uh, this is a document that he created. Uh, sort, of, sort of very interested in this because it was an attempt to make a um, almost a kind of a fake, a false artifact. So this is the I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of it. This is the book that is they find in uh, Moria that has the fate of yes um, in Balin's tomb. Yeah, yep. uh, I can't remember the name of the book. Um, this is the, this is the last page of it, and actually in yeah. the film they show that book and they show um, the design of of that book in the yeah. last page yeah. of it, where you see the ink line trailing off as you see here. Uh, but I was very interested in this because, of course, Tolkien was literally he literally made a kind of facsimile artifact from his his world. I mean, he sort of tore the paper and and and, and burnt it. You can see how it's kind of burnt on the edges to represent the kind of um, you know the kind of destruction that it went through. Uh, uh, so that, that is quite fascinating to me. What I find um, just interesting about this from an aesthetic level, I mean, I'll, I'll allude to it here. Um, going back to calligraphy briefly, um, this that is you know, that is the inscription of Balin's tomb, relaying this back to that scene. Um, of course. This is Elder Futark. This is Viking runes. Um, I find it quite fascinating that, because of course the, the script is um, uh, Kerth, and um, it's um, written in um, uh, Khazadul, uh, which is the, the dwarven language. But nevertheless, I find it interesting how Tolkien is trying to imagine um, runic symbols as some form of um, actual bona fide. Um, alphabet um, written mm. on parchment. Yeah, uh, yes. of course that wouldn't that wouldn't have existed at all. But um, nevertheless, no. I find it interesting that um, because of course when that happened historically, they were writing in the Latin alphabet by that time. Sorry, forgive me. Anyway, um, just one little note. But um, this is you know, an element with all of um Tolkien's calligraphy. His languages are fascinating in a way. But um, I think with El- with Elder Futark and um, Kerf in particular. The influence is obvious. Um, moving on to uh, cartography. Yeah, so cartography. So this is um, uh, a map with extensive annotations. I mean, obviously, uh, you're not going to be able to really see it, but um, uh, so. Well, this is Doriath, and um, so yeah. this would have been, I, I believe, if my geography is correct, uh, north of um, Middle-earth, and of course Doriath was um, the realm of Luthien, um, who you can say is essentially the surrogate for Tolkien's wife, Edith, Mm. in the Silmarillion. Um, But of course, if we're going over some sort of... I'm sorry, I do my my throat at the moment. Um, If we're going over some sort of chronology of cartography, um, I would have imagined that these early works on Doriath and the Silmarillion would have predated what we later see in Middle Earth, uh, principally because the work and the inspiration came much earlier. Yes, and and I think the bits and pieces of uh, so the map that people are familiar with was actually drawn by um, Pauline Baines, who was an illustrator who was uh, not only f- she was friends with Tolkien and his wife, mm-hmm. but also worked it very extensively in many of her illustrations. Certainly, the map is be- being one of the most famous. Um, but uh, she she did that, you know, the map that people know, the map of Middle Earth. But it is based upon a lot of these ver- these much earlier maps, and there's sort of fragments. Mm. There's one of the of uh, the the Wilderland and the Mirkwood and and such. Yeah. Um, and so you you sort of see this coming together of this this type of cartography. I mean, I think very much, even though of course it's Pauline Baines's map in the end. It is very much Tolkien's idiosyncratic uh, style of cartography that she's reflecting, uh, you know, in that in that more famous version. And I think it's because Tolkien also did a kind of painted version of that later on. Uh, and of course, as well. which, um, 
what I love about you know, Tolkien and how this work mirrors the process and actually mirrors his own in-world mythology. You're talking about how the um, the actual world changed over time um, and received you know, uh, helpings and other influences. But of course, if you look at the music of the Ainur, the creation of the world, you know, of Arda essentially and of Middle Earth, the world itself goes through several changes and the landforms change <laughs> until right. we arrive finally at this form of Middle Earth. Yeah, so this I, is both I, this wonderful. is both um, out of universe and in universe canonical. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that Tolkien imagined that, that. Of course, he, he imagined that the creator of the world would would mirror his tendencies as a, as a creator of someone. Well, someone yes, um, that, that's tr true to the spirit of um, uh, Mito Poeo, isn't it? Yeah. He, he, is, he, is, he is the Logos. He is the um, <laughs> the driving force of the universe. <laughs> force of the universe. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, what, the, the funny thing, I didn't have it included here, but there was a, a kind of um, proof uh, that Pauline Baines did of the map and then what she, what she gave to Tolkien, which he made extensive annotations on it you know i mean he was uh uh you know even at that stage uh <laughs> to making a making a lot of kind of corrections and changes you know um so, so it, is, it is sort of fascinating that it all became a kind of it, it all became such a coherent world but i mean you see very much a flux you know, a world in flux when you see these these kind of early maps now, I hate to um, rush you, Dee, but can we very quickly, because we've got about five minutes left, Okay, um, that's fine. go over these these covers? So first of all, well, The Hobbit. Yeah, so I sort of ended with these. I mean, these are just, uh, these are uh, uh, the cover designs that Tolkien made for the, the the Hobbit and for the three books of The Lord of the Rings. Um, the most realized one, of course, is this one of The Hobbit, where he's, I mean, literally, uh, you know, he's conceived of how the how the kind of how, how the spine will kind of work with the design and um you know this is a i think i think it's a very competent cover uh, i don't know that this was did they did they actually use this yes it's i got that version yes you've got that yeah i mean it wasn't the first edition but no, I my, don't, my, I, my edition is gosh the something in the 1980s but um it wasn't the first edition certainly the first edition <clears throat> Actually, no, I won't try and get it up. We don't have time. Yeah, um, no, but it, yeah, but, uh, but it wasn't it, this. Yes, it wasn't this. But I mean, of course, we we, we mentioned his his difficulties with uh, getting the publisher to accept his designs. But late, later on, he did get the chance, and I, I, I this was certainly used. Um, and uh, it is very interesting to see him come up with, uh, you know, I think quite a competent uh, uh, dust jacket design, um, and. So next is, uh, of course, the Fellowship of the Ring. F famously, of course, the Eye of Sauron uh, in, mm. in the center here, uh, the, the Tolkien conception of it, and of course with the with the the, the black uh, the black the black speech, uh, the you know the famous inscription around the yes, ring. Yes, Ting so. Tingvar and the black speech, but also the One Ring, and obviously the I'm guessing these are the three Elven rings. The Elven uh, ring. Bound to it, yeah. So obviously the one ring to rule them all, um, and of course the famous two towers. Um, or in this cover, it's ex it's very ambiguous because the impression here, of course, is Minas Tirith and um, yeah, uh, Marador uh, rather than Orthanc. Again, the ambiguity of the title. Yes, because I mean, because I certainly don't picture either Orthanc or Barador as, as a white tower, so I'm not sure. What specifically? Uh, yeah, minister is probably right, but uh, uh, the, and these covers were eventually used. I do believe there's fairly recent editions that use the Tolkien designs for the dust jacket. Uh, I mean, I would say that there's the germ of a good idea with with all of these jackets, but I think that that uh, I think they were probably right in sort of going with a with with a, with a with a professional design, you know, again, I think, it, I think these are, are, are fascinating for people who are fans of the series, but I think that they show the limitation of Tolkien's, you know, sort of abilities in this area. It's a very specific type of design, a book jacket. Um, and then we see the wonderful uh, Return of the King. And again, very much laden with, uh, you know, with various symbologies that, you know, that we're familiar with. Um, 
course, I can't. I'm, my brain is not working. It's very late, so I'm trying to think of the name of that tree. And oh, the White Tree of Gondor. The, 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 the oh, oh, so yeah, the, the specific uh, specific name, but um, anyway, and of course, uh, Mordor was sort of wonderfully depicted. I mean, I I think of the three of Tolkien's uh, jacket designs. I like this best, but um, but it, it again shows his 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 sort of overarching concern with. Uh, the, the symbolic representations uh, in the book and using that as a kind of cipher for the work itself. Yes, I mean, um, the, there is a historic allusion, of, obviously, to, I believe it's the um, um, the Egg de la Seal, which is the, the life tree, um, yeah. which, of course, is obviously the, the motif of the white tree. But um, I think that's a wonderful place to leave off. We've actually managed to get through all of your images. Um, I won't talk about calligraphy. Maybe that'll um, uh, have, have to sort of um, talk about that some other time. But anyway, um, thank you very much, Dee. This has been a, um, a wonderful and um, fascinating conversation. I've um, really enjoyed your insights. So thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to have gotten the chance to participate in uh, Tolkien Day. Absolutely. So thank you very much. And um what will be next after this um columba will be scheduled after this on this channel so um stay if, stay for columba he has two more videos and then afterwards it's nathan hood anyway thank you very much for watching and i hope you continue to enjoy talking day